Now, these are what we would call the elementary steps. A mechanism is made up of elementary steps. A mechanism is made up of a bunch of elementary steps. When we said this was a two-step reaction, we really meant a two-elementary step reaction, but usually we use relays and we don't say elementary. For that matter, when we proposed this mechanism, this was proposed as an elementary step. We were proposing that the mechanism happened in one elementary step. But when I wrote this down, I wasn't saying this was an elementary step. I was saying this was the overall reaction. The overall reaction is different from the elementary steps, although in some cases they could be the same. It's possible that the overall reaction happened in one elementary step, but it's also possible it happened in two elementary steps, neither of which perfectly matches the overall reaction. So what is an elementary step? How does it differ from the overall reaction? Well, again, the overall reaction just tells you the starting materials and the products without actually telling you what's actually going on between the molecules. The elementary steps tell you what's actually going on. They tell you how the things are actually interacting with each other. We're saying that this O3 actually did kick out one oxygen. And then that oxygen really did meet up with another O3. Whereas in this case, we're proposing a different mechanism. In this case, the two O3s really just did bump into each other directly, which didn't happen here. All right, so your textbook gives the definition an elementary step is a step that's not made up out of, out of simpler steps. Well, we're proposing that this is as simple as we can get. That's what elementary means. An element is something that can't be broken down. Uh, so they have some terminology for elementary steps. Uh, molecularity, which your instructor might have used in class. Molecularity uh, basically tells us how many starting materials um, there are in the step. For example, the molecularity of this step is two, because in this case, it takes actually two molecules reacting with each other. Usually we think of these numbers as moles, but here, since we're thinking about what actually happened, we should interpret it as molecules. We're thinking of two molecules of O3 bumping into each other. Maybe a more intuitive way to write this here would be like this. We're just saying two separate molecules of O3 bumped into each other. So the molecularity of this step would be bimolecular. That's a very intuitive term, I think. What's the molecularity of this step? Unimolecular. Unimolecular. Because there's only one atom by itself. How can you have a reaction with one atom by itself? Well, we said it's actually not that hard. This is a single atom that just kicks out one of its pieces. So you can react just by yourself. And what's the molecularity of this step? Yeah, um, I crossed this out, but that's not because it doesn't exist here. It's because it crossed out when we did the overall reaction. It exists in the elementary step. Maybe I should put that, that back in. So it should be bimolecular. It's also possible to have termolecular, which means three molecules in that one step. But that's actually quite rare. Why is it rare that an elementary step would be termolecular? That's right. The key thing that you said is you used the very simple term of bump into each other. Remember, these molecules are not, even though I talk like they are, they're not little people. They're not looking for each other to have a reaction. They only react when they accidentally bump into each other. Well, how likely it is, how likely is it that three separate molecules would all bump into each other at the same time uh, with the exact right orientation and energy? Not that likely. So it's possible there are termolecular steps, but they're less likely than unimolecular or bimolecular. Okay. So that's an important skill to take a look at that. I don't think we really applied that to this, though, because this is the overall reaction. We applied those terms of molecularities to the elementary steps. Is it tri or termolecular? Uh, the convention is that it's termolecular. That's right. It seems like it would be logical to say tri-molecular. That's what we usually say. But the, uh, the convention is that it's called, sure, you might have heard of tertiary. So that is another root that's used for three, ter-molecular. So. I don't have any examples of termolecular steps on the board, but you will see them every once in a while. <coughs> Some termolecular elementary steps occur, but they're extremely rare because of the probability of three particles colliding simultaneously with enough energy and effective orientation is very small. 
Higher molecularities are not known, so we don't have to learn about tetramolecular. Again, how likely is it that four things would accidentally bump into each other in just the right way? Now, let's talk about uh, rate laws. So let's try to write down what the rate law would be for our overall reaction here. What should we write down as the rate law for this overall reaction? Three concentration of all three. Concentration of what? Over three. Anything else we need to put in there? You mean the exponent? Okay, so you're correct. We need an exponent up here. Do we know that the exponent is the number two? No, we don't. You cannot figure out what the exponent for the rate law is from the coefficients from the overall reaction. You cannot get this exponent from the coefficients for the overall reaction. That's a, I expect that to be a common trap on the test that you have to watch out for. So I have to call this, say, x, some variable. In fact, if you remember on Friday, one of the things you learned on Friday is how to figure out what x is. I think you all watched the part of the video where I talked about how to find these exponents. Well, if we could just get it from here, we wouldn't need that. So um, the exponent is unknown. Generally, you get the exponent from the experimental data. Knowing the balanced equation is not enough. And that makes sense because the rate depends on how the reaction actually happened. But this doesn't tell us how the reaction actually happened. So how could it give us the exact right numbers for the rate? So this is maybe one of the most important skills in this chapter is writing down the rate expression and then filling in the details. So here we have this rate expression, but we don't know this detail yet. Now, uh, this is a little more complicated than I made it seem. Actually, there's two different reactions happening here. There's the forward reaction and there's the reverse reaction. Um, ozone is turning into oxygen, and also, at the same time, oxygen is turning into ozone. Generally, both of those would be happening at the same time. Sometimes the forward reaction is happening faster, and on net, you're producing more product. And sometimes the reverse reaction is happening faster, and on net, you're producing more starting materials. Um, what about if both reactions are happening at the same rate? I don't know if you guys, you, I you briefly might have talked about it in class. What do we call the situation where both the forward and the reverse reaction are happening at the same rate? That's called equilibrium, which I think you're going to be going over on Friday as a whole new chapter, but we're starting to talk about equilibrium now. Equilibrium is when the forward rate equals the reverse rate, which means that on net, the amount of starting materials and products isn't changing. But that's not because we're not making any more starting materials. We are, but we're using them up at the same exact rate. So at the macroscopic level, we're in equilibrium. So that's a concept you'll see more on Friday, but we have to start talking about now. So this is good to make a note of because we'll need that later today. In equilibrium, the forward rate equals the reverse rate. Equilibrium means equal. Well, the things that are equal are the forward rate and the reverse rate. In equilibrium, the forward rate equals the reverse rate. That's the equilibrium. If the forward rate was bigger, the reaction would be moving forward on net. And if the reverse rate was bigger, the reaction would be moving in reverse on net. So when they're equal, we must be in equilibrium. OK, um, so this has both the forward rate um, and a reverse rate, which kind of complicates things. So in this chapter, we generally um, want to uh, simplify things and only focus on one direction. And the way we do that is we assume we're just looking at the initial rate. Because if you start initially, there's only starting materials and no products. Initially, there's only starting materials and no products, which means initially only the forward reaction is happening and the reverse reaction isn't happening. Because if there's no products, how can the products be turning into starting materials? So if you focus on the initial point, then you can focus just on the forward rate and not on the reverse rate. And that, again, is the main thing you went over on Friday and that you saw in the videos. Um, you saw how to figure out this exponent from the experimental data, but you might have noticed in those tables that the tables always say that they're giving you the initial rates. <coughs> well, the reason for that is because you're just focusing on the forward reaction. You can see this is only for focusing on the forward reaction, right? Because it only has O3 in it and no O2. That's why we're only putting the starting material in here and no product, because we're just focusing on the forward reaction and not on the reverse reaction. Okay. Uh, we're going to continue to do that for most of the time here. We'll be, uh, so when we say the rate law, we really mean the rate law for the forward reaction, and we can ignore the reverse because we're looking at the initial rate. 